Woman Decker, welcome to the Symposium on Food Insecurity and Hunger. We at the University of Waikato in, in New Aotearoa, New Zealand, would like to thank the conference organisers for providing us with an opportunity to share our experiences in this global forum. Firstly, we acknowledge the custodians and first residents of the Melbourne region, acknowledge the human suffering of the participants in the research. I, Ophelia Stolter, had the pleasure of chairing this symposium and introducing the thought-provoking presentations. The following is just a bit of a brief preamble um, to the topic of this symposium. Hunger and food security in a relatively wealthy nation such as New Zealand, that exports over 80% of the food produced is a stark contradiction. The reality of hunger, deprivation and need do not normally feature in representations and international narratives about New Zealand. Instead, we hear more about New Zealand as a seemingly idyllic haven far away from many of the world's problems. Since New Zealand was colonised, the country has been marketed as a place for people to forge new lives of health and opportunity for themselves and their families. Further, New Zealand has been in the international news media quite a lot due to achievements in sports, movies and politics. This has only increased the mythological status of New Zealand. Such international narratives are now key reasons why some of the world's wealthiest individuals are buying land in New Zealand and building bunkers so that when the crisis arrives at their doorstep, they have a bolt hole. This is a bit of a tangent, but this symposium to, um, that we're presenting is about some of the aspects of New Zealand society that stand in contrast to the mythological representations of New Zealand as a land of plenty and or as a lost paradise. This symposium presents and explores the ways in which insufficient access to food materialises experiences of poverty. A key concern is the invisibility and the downplaying of hunger in wealthy neoliberal nations. Each of the presentations illustrates how broader socio-political and economic factors play out materially in the everyday lives of marginalised groups by restricting their access to food. The presenters in the symposium are all both scholars and activists, along with having a strong commitment to social justice and solidarity. Dr Rebecca Graham has a PhD in psychology She's a registered community psychologist and was the, has been the recipient of various scholarships and she's also received the New Zealand Psychological Society Social Justice Award. Rebecca is the current chair of the New Zealand Institute of Community Psychology. She's also employed as the CEO of an NGO supporting parents of sight impaired children. Alongside this, Rebecca is still actively involved with academic research and teaching in the community psychology program. I don't know when she sleeps, given that she also has a family of, with four children, including one child with disabilities. Kimberly Graham is a current PhD student at the University of Waikato. Kimberly's PhD research offers an in-depth community and historical lens to understanding responses to child hunger in New Zealand during two different historical periods. Kimberly has studied and taught in a range of social science disciplines including psychology, sociology and social policy. Kimberly employs a unique approach in psychology by utilising a historical narrative lens through which to defamiliarise the present. As a mature student, Kimberly has juggled the multiple demands of caregiving for both children and elderly parents. Kimberly also holds the thought at home whenever her husband, a senior medical specialist, is consumed by health emergencies, which has clearly only increased um, in 2020. Dr Bridget Masters Awateri is a senior lecturer and she is the Community Psychology Graduate Program Convener. She's also the co-director of the Māori and Psychology Research Unit. Bridget has many other roles in the, on committees in relation to Māori issues for staff and students on campus. 
Bridget has extensive expertise in Indigenous and Kaupapa Māori research and evaluation methods. She has worked in private practice, especially alongside NGO and community sectors. Bridget has received numerous grants for her research focusing on Indigenous people's experiences in the health system. As a Māori woman, extended family and tribal responsibilities are woven into her everyday life. Bridget, her husband and her two children are currently involved in an environmental project to restore Indigenous vegetation on their tribal lands. The four of us who have put together this symposium certainly hope that you will find aspects of interest and things that resonate with you in the three presentations that come to follow. Kia ora koutou. Ko wai au, e haere mai o ka tupuni potirangi no Glasgow ia. Ko David White o ka tupuna no Kirikiri Road i Papakainga ka waka to tainui. Aho i noho ana. Ko Rebecca Graham and my name is Rebecca Graham and this is my presentation today which is based on my PhD work which I did under the supervision of Dr Otley Stolt who introduced us uh, and also Professor Darren Hodgetts and Professor Kerry Chamberlain. Uh, when I give this presentation I'm just going to skip through the initial first half uh, and if you're more interested in finding out more about each of these slides there is a reference and a link so you can look up and, and have a look in greater detail and then spend a bit more time on the interesting stuff more towards the end. Uh, in giving this presentation, I'm aware that it's more for an international context. Uh, and so uh, on starting, I really want to talk about these particular contexts within Aotearoa New Zealand and within which my research is based. New Zealand is a wealthy food producing country. Uh, we produce enough food for approximately 40 million people and we're a country of around 5 million. So we are a nation of farmers, we export food, we have high quality food that we export. Uh, we're also, as I said, a wealthy nation, so when we talk about poverty and hunger in New Zealand, it's within the context of a nation that is wealthy, uh, that does very well, that actually could afford to feed all its people if we wanted to. Additionally, in New Zealand, when we think about the economic, social and political spheres, uh, we've had 30 years uh, of neoliberal thought in which neoliberalism has dominated particularly political thought, but of course that's broadened out to economic thought and has now turned into sort of a social thinking as well. So that is the context within which we live and challenging that is part of what we're doing here. Uh, some of these neoliberal narratives are that sort of moralising and the individualising and the deficit-oriented ways in which we view people and ignore the broader structural stuff that impacts on individuals and instead just focus on how individuals need to do better while completely ignoring all the barriers and insufficient access to resources that are put in place. In terms of my PhD, one of the things I was particularly interested in is everyday life. Just the really ordinary, mundane things that people do without really thinking or pay attention to, but which reflect that broader socio-political atmosphere within which we live. Uh, and lastly, uh, why food? Uh, we looked at food because food uh, is a very complex topic, but when you think about the ways in which you can access food, where you go to get food, how you get the food, how you bring it home, what you do with the food once it's there, how you prepare it, store it, eat it, consume it, the ways in which you prepare it, the types of foods you eat, all of that reflects uh, who we are, where we're from, it's a nexus of social practices, but it also materialises power and inequality in terms of who has access to what and who can cook what. Uh, so in our first slide, uh, this is a nutritionism paper, and we've got the link there. Oh, no, it's a community meal. My apologies. Uh, so the community meal was where I started the PhD. I went along to the community meal. I got to know the people who went along there. It uh, happened every Wednesday night, and around 100, 150 people would attend. And it was a, a really lovely mix. There were some older folk who would come, and you can see that in the picture on the slide. 
older folk would come because it was a really lovely way of having a dinner out with people, not having to do the dishes, being able to enjoy the company of others. Uh, there were families with children who, again, uh, unable to afford a dinner out, but really appreciated having the night off cooking for the kids and just being able to come out and have a nice dinner and socialise and interact with folk. Uh, and there was also a, a cohort of particularly single older men who may not have been homeless, but in that sort of space of not really having a fixed abode and not really having someone to cook for them and not really having someone who could look after some of their needs in terms of cooking a hearty meal. Uh, and this meal in particular was always a two-course. It was always a very hearty, very filling main meal and then again likewise with the dessert. So it was a lovely meal. I very much enjoyed being able to attend and it was from the community meal and getting to know people that I was then able to... Uh, talk with some people further in depth who made up the case studies that are part of my PhD. And you can see there on the slide uh, the pseudonyms of the people I interviewed. Uh, some households were quite complex and so I had interviews with more than one person in those households. Uh, and together uh, I had a series of interviews, so each household I went along with them when they did their grocery shopping and talked to them about how food came into the house and all that kind of thing. Uh, participants also took photos, so they would photograph their world of food and then we'd have an interview where we talked about those photographs and what was in them and what was happening. Uh, and then also just a couple of sit-down interviews, again, where we talked about how food came into the house, uh, a variety of topics really. Uh, and together that series of interviews made up some really rich, uh, really thick descriptions of people's lives and everyday life and what was happening uh, and a really rich, very rich uh, set of information and data there that we then used in the analysis. Uh, so the first paper, the Nutritionism paper, this was really because in reaction to, really in reaction to a number of the papers that I read when I was reading about community meals and the research that was currently out there was heavily deficit oriented. Uh, and what seemed to be a quite a common research practice is researchers would go along to a homeless shelter or to a sort of a meal and recruit their participants and then they'd line them up and they would measure, do skin fold measurements, they'd measure how fat or how thin they were, they would take blood tests, they would then measure those bloods to see how deficient these folk were in various things, uh, such as vitamin C, for example, uh, and completely ignored the wider social context of what was happening in these people's lives. Our recommendations would be things like, well, uh, we ran the bloods and we found that people are really low in vitamin C, and so what the homeless shelter needs to do is provide oranges for people to eat after the meal, uh, which is not a bad suggestion, but it completely ignored that actually when you're homeless, you've got a whole bunch of other issues associated with your health and a whole bunch of other stresses, and adding an orange didn't address any of those wider health issues. And so we really wanted to write something that was considering the wider social context of community meals, of what their purpose is, that it's not just about providing nutrition, it's about that social interaction and the space of belonging and being able to come and have a meal with friends. And some of the recommendations were just, from our perspective, incredibly facile and incredibly out of touch. Uh, and we really wanted to take a more humanistic, person-centred approach that acknowledge that charity isn't a solution to food insecurity, that meeting and alleviating that immediate need is great, but it's no long-term solution to addressing the inequalities in our society that drive the food insecurity in the first place. Uh, another paper uh, was considering the shame and stigma that people feel when they can't afford food and what that does to people who are living with it and the ways in which they... Uh, engage in acts of passing so that it's not obvious to outsiders that food insecurity is an issue. And this is particularly relevant for a New Zealand context where the neoliberal narratives are incredibly cruel to parents who cannot afford food or are struggling to feed their kids. And so these acts, that cruelty and that narrative means that parents are unable to talk about this without inviting shame and abuse and judgment 
Uh, and so they do things like pass and, and act as though their household's fine, when actually they could probably do with a little bit of assistance there. Uh, talk, thinking about everyday life, uh, this is one of the households, one of the complex households, and you can see there in the pictures that you know there are a lot of ways in which this family make things, uh, make ends meet. They stretch out meals, uh, they create, uh, they cook communally, they sort of create large meals for everybody using what's available. And this household in particular had a lot of strategies that they employed in order to keep everybody fed. Some of them were quite time intensive, some of them were quite stressful. Sometimes it would involve one person who was nominated to go to the welfare office and endure all of that pain uh, in order to bring home food for the family. Uh, other times it would be another member of the household who would utilise their connections uh, to sort some food out. Uh, and amongst this very communal, very sharing household, there were also acts of hoarding where uh, people would hoard food in their room to ensure that their child would always have breakfast and always have enough to eat. And that is one of the contradictions in this space, is that when you experience food insecurity, there are things that you have to do in order to survive that you might not otherwise engage in. And particularly uh, in a New Zealand context, it's quite common for people to see these very rational responses to food insecurity as evidence of this person's deficit nature or inability to get it together, when actually it's a very sensible reaction to a situation that is just about intolerable. So, PhD research done, publication sorted, food insecurity is still an issue. For me in particular, it was really important not to stop there, to be able to step outside the academic uh, world, which is great, but to really get stuck in and roll my sleeves up and talk to people who uh, engage in some of these narratives, who think some of these things, who've never thought about, actually, this attitude that I have towards people who can't afford to feed their kids, uh, actually, maybe it's not quite correct. Uh, and you can see one of those attitudes there, uh, you know, New Zealand Herald, this whole idea that uh, beneficiaries are lazy, which is completely untrue, and wanting to really push back against those attitudes and say, hang on, there's some other stuff happening here. Uh, so I started writing some pieces for the spin-off, uh, which is a local online news site, uh, and taking those ideas that we discussed from the PhD and just putting them into everyday context so that uh, anybody could pick it up and read it and start to think and be challenged in their thinking around how we talk about this. Uh, and there's some ideas there around, you know, poor New Zealand families don't need your crappy advice, thank you very much. It's a little bit provocative, but that's the idea, You're talking to uh, people who are food secure and have never experienced what it's like. Uh, very widely read. I think some of my pieces were, there we go, one of the most read pieces, so really, people were really interested in that. However, there was some pushback. Uh, it's really hard for people when you start to challenge their long-held beliefs. They don't want to hear it, or they're very committed to believing it, and so when you challenge it, people can get quite cross. Uh, and really, you know, absolutely try to reassert the hegemony, reassert those narratives that actually it's poor parenting. Uh, and there's another one there about uh, just getting a bit snarky. And that's, that's fine because you're challenging some and some people don't want to hear it, but the more you speak out and the more you get out there, um, the more people realise that actually you know what you're doing and then that's when it gets a little bit personal. And let's be honest, if you're starting to challenge dominant narratives, people are going to respond, they're going to push back and that is where as community sites it's really important having those connections where you can support each other and have a laugh about it and joke about having a PhD in Coppola. Um, this one's one of my faves, I just find it hilarious. I'm quite looking forward to my focused retirement. 
good times. Um, uh, and this, this, well, some people just aren't very nice. Um, there's some others. These are the funny ones. Uh, but like I say, what's the point? What's the point of privilege if you're not using it in some way to challenge hegemony and engage in change? I am very fortunate to have been given, you know, privilege in our society, and I think it's what do you do with it? You use it, you make a change, you just keep pushing. Uh, in conclusion, food insecurity is a socio-structural issue that results from society's inequities. When people don't have enough to eat, that affects all sorts of other aspects of their life. When we engage in research, it's really important to engage in socially responsive research that uh, challenges deficit-oriented ideas and puts things like food insecurity into that wider social context. And lastly, social justice work and research is deeply personal. Remaining detached and objective simply works to support the status quo. Kia ora. Uh, kia ora, I'm Kimberly from the University of Waikato. I'm going to talk to you today about part of my PhD project called The Milk of Human Kindness. And my talk today is entitled Rationing the Sandwiches. And the reason I've called it that is to highlight some of the issues with the current model in New Zealand of dealing with hunger that at the moment are based quite significantly on a charity model. Um, and I want to draw attention to the fact that charity, although it appears like a compassionate way of taking action, is actually a form of rationing in the way that it operates. So I suppose the backdrop to this is that um, there's been a lot of attention to child hunger in New Zealand recently, um, from the early 2000s in particular, um, and there are now a large number of NGOs, groups, charities and individuals that are feeding children in schools. So my project is entitled The Milk of Human Kindness because I started from the reintroduction of free school milk in New Zealand schools. Um, so like Australia, we had a milk scheme back in the day from 1937 till 1967, um, and it was stopped because it wasn't really seen as necessary anymore. So when it was reintroduced in 2012, 2013, it raised quite a few questions about what that meant um, in terms of the growing problem of food insecurity and how we were going to try to deal with it in schools. So that community psychology approach of thinking about social problems as having historical roots seem to be quite appropriate for this project. So our original milk scheme was post the Great Depression and it was part of the introduction of our whole welfare state. Um, and it was kind of part of that safety net. Um, but the current approach is uh, coming from quite a different model. So that's one of the things that um, struck me when I started my research. So one of the ways I wanted to defamiliarise the way that child hunger was being talked about in the present was through addressing how we talked about it in the past. So I was thinking about the structure of feeling, which is um, developed by a cultural theorist, um, Raymond Williams, and it's really about some of the not quite explicit boundaries that we place around issues. So how are people actually thinking and talking about the issue of child hunger um, in mainstream settings? And these boundaries are often kind of rooted in historical processes. So I wanted to see how the choices about child hunger were being shaped and sustained through social, economic, political, cultural and material processes. Um, and these have profound impacts on citizens that are living with um, food insecurity. So the methods I deployed were based in narrative psychology, which is really just paying attention to the way that human beings create meaning 
um, and shared meaning through stories. And we do this at lots of different levels. We do it as individuals and we might draw from resources that are at the level of um, family, community, and then there are dominant narratives that are more the mainstream understandings that develop, particularly in mainstream media and policy settings. So I used a really broad range of material in order to try to capture narratives at all these different levels and in all these different spaces. Um, and so I included a historical analysis um, and I also spoke to some low-income parents who were feeding their children without really enough resources to feed everyone in the household. Um, but today I'm going to be focusing particularly on what I found in contemporary mainstream media and policy and political analysis, um, which was really looking at these dominant narratives that were shaping responses to child hunger in schools. And I've included the quote from Brunner, um, a narrative psychologist, um, to highlight the fact that this is um, a process that involves power. So why one story rather than another is a really pivotal question when you're thinking about inequities. So this um, land of plenty is really an important narrative that has shaped uh, New Zealand's historical story as a nation. Um, and it's really shaped the fact that there's quite a denial of real poverty existing in Aotearoa. Um, this land of plenty is obviously um, prefaced on the idea that we appropriate the land from Māori. Um, so it's, it's a very much part of a kind of dominant Pākehā concept that there's enough for everyone and if you work hard enough, you will not go hungry. And we're still subjected to this. It's, it's a powerful narrative. This quote is from John Key when he was Prime Minister in 2012 in which he said many children living in homes dependent on welfare are living in poverty as it is defined in a developed economy. So there's care there with defining the poverty as relative and potentially not real. Obviously we have a series of sticks and carrots and it needs to be very clear that if you can work, you should work. So he's defining the poverty in a particular way and he's situating the problem as welfare dependency. And the result of this is statistics like this, which paint a pretty grim picture in New Zealand. Um, we really have a lot of children who are living lives that are not uh, supporting their health and flourishing. And these figures have shifted significantly in a matter of a few decades. So the response to this has been for charity and advocacy groups to claim child poverty as a really important tool to mobilise compassion. Um, so, so we are less conditional in the way we respond to a child suffering as opposed to an adult in the contemporary environment. Um, you know, children are really special and important and vulnerable. And they are supposed to be dependent, which is in contrast to the unworthy dependence that John Key was talking about earlier. But also there's a visibility issue because schools are still quite mixed in New Zealand in terms of income groups. So people were actually seeing this problem. It was confronting them every day and that was very difficult for people to kind of bear. So they weren't able to ignore it. Um, and also there's this idea that children who have issues with poverty in the present are going to continue to um, be a problem as adults, in a sense. Um, so we tend to think of poverty for children as creating issues across the lifespan. Um, so so the, the charities are using child poverty to instigate compassion, and it can be a sort of a bridge in order to activate our compassion. Um, and this is what we end up with. This is something, type of thing, advertising that's become familiar to New Zealanders. Um, it's a way of tugging at heartstrings in order to help children 
Um, and charities tell us that this works, that when people feel upset by this, they will help these children by donating their time and money. However, there's just a problem with this because we're still reinforcing deserving and undeserving distinctions quite strongly. Um, and we know from the research that children are usually the last people in the household to go hungry. Um, so everyone else is already restricting their nutrition before a child shows up at school without food in most cases. Um, and it can just continually characterise children in terms of their future economic productivity. So they become kind of future citizen workers and consumers instead of us really caring about them in the present. And then something that comes through strongly in my research is the fact that when we characterise children as innocent victims, uh, it, it sort of characterises the parents as being to blame and that's been quite a strong feature. So, this dominant model of child poverty has become quite popular politically, and um, child hunger in schools, um, particularly during the 2000s, was kind of building up momentum um, in terms of people seeing it in the media and wanting to respond to it, but there wasn't very much happening at the government level. So these are two school lunch boxes. This was in a very prominent uh, media campaign, really, by um, John Campbell and in the mainstream media, where he started talking to teachers, to principals, to doctors um, about what they were seeing. And this is um, a lunch, school lunches that he, he kept on showing these lunch boxes. So on this side, there's Decile 10, which is a wealthy school, the wealthiest schools. And this packet of snacks is, was the lunch in a Decile 1 school, so the poorer schools that we have. Um, and this actually started to create quite a reaction for people in terms of not wanting to tolerate this. So I looked at the core narratives that were coalescing around child hunger and feeding children in schools in mainstream media, commentary and political material. And I kind of created, I could see that there were five core narratives um, that kind of summarise how this issue was being shaped. So the first one I called punitive responsibilising, which is basically that parents are the problem, um, and that if we try to feed children in schools outside of that, we're actually uh, making it worse. And also, other people's children are not, are not my responsibility, they're the parents' responsibility. Um, the second one is taxpayer sovereignty, uh, which is really, well, we do feel sad about the children and we might need to help them. However, the taxpayer should not be responsible for that. They shouldn't have to foot the bill for other parents' irresponsibility. So if we get businesses and charities to step in, then that's a win-win for everybody. Another common one was the communitarianism. So this is the idea that communities need to be restored to capability. Um, so expanding state responsibility for these issues is going to make things worse because it creates more dependency. So this model really supports initiatives that help communities get back on their feet. And then virtuous benevolence is the idea that charity is actually the most appropriate response because helpers and children connecting with each other emphasises kindness and compassion. And people really love this concept of giving back. Um, and and well-off citizens want to do things to help children. Um, and so the state is too impersonal in this model. It's, it seemed to be a better thing for people to have to do this themselves and to connect with people. And then the fifth one, which I found at the time of my research was quite dominant in New Zealand, in fact, I've called third way pragmatism. It's a kind of softening of neoliberalism, but it's highly practical in its orientation. So it sort of bypasses what, what the causes might be. And it says, let's just roll our sleeves up 
and not chatter on about politics or complex causal factors. If children are hungry, this is a crisis and they don't deserve that, so let's just feed them. Um, and so this model does facilitate some involvement of the state, but also other people getting involved as well. So what do we learn from these narratives? Well, really what the narratives are trying to do is establish how to characterise children, parents and the people helping them in lots of different ways. But you can see that most of them bypass the parents. So the first one actually directly blames the parents. And the third one wants them to help themselves and to withdraw the state. But the others are really about, let's not worry about the parents at all, let's pretend they don't exist. So responses to hunger in schools, which involve lots of different people coming into schools to try to help, they demonstrate to us that our compassion has a kind of boundary around it. And this is something historically, socially and culturally mediated. Um, so a lot of the dominant narratives are, are about how to establish who is worthy and who is deserving. Compassion for children seems like a good way to instigate help for people on low incomes, but actually it can sit quite nicely side by side with anger towards the parents because the children become victims of their parents' failures. Um, so a lot of what we do in New Zealand is about writing out the parents and rendering them somewhat invisible and and the other people that are speaking in the symposium kind of you can see the same issue um, and also just the fact that we can't save children and abandon and abandon their own families it, there's no rational logic to this really so this is what we now have lots of people coming in to help lots and lots of different initiatives, businesses, individuals, charities, and we do now have a very limited pilot government scheme that's been introduced in low decile schools. Um, the COVID lockdown in New Zealand did recently reveal quite a problem because children who were relying on school to feed them were not there, and the charities that were feeding the schools became very distressed about this and ended up trying to shift their models quite a bit and to feed children at home more, which was kind of interesting. So COVID revealed a little bit of a flaw with relying on the school to do this. Um, so the upshot of this really is that we've ended up with ways of feeding children in New Zealand that... Um, that almost stop us from looking at the upstream causes. And the tight emphasis in New Zealand on primary school children, because they are the target of the majority of the schemes, is tending to you know, really include some and leave some out. Um, and essentially, other members of the family that are hungry remain invisible. So, you know, we need to be asking why it's okay for mothers to go without food and we only want to feed their child. Um, and this is the point in my talk where people say, but surely doing something is better than doing nothing. We don't want to turn away from this. And, of course, my answer to that question is, yes, it is better to do something than do nothing. However... <laughs> The way that we're doing things at the moment is actually ad hoc and inadequate, and it's an ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, which is actually depoliticising the problem of food insecurity because people are trying to fix it at the bottom end. And of course children have a right to be fed, but when we're trying to patch over these divides, um, our compassion for children is not going to be enough. So we need to make the sandwiches but have conversations that go beyond that. And we need to have the difficult conversations about the causes. So the dominant narratives that I uncovered are very important because they currently decide how these sandwiches get rationed. However, in my hopeful mood, I could say that feeding children in school could be part 
of a social justice and rights-based framework, and it could be part of addressing low resources in whole households and become a kind of institutionalised form of egalitarianism if we could deliver it in a way that reflects a different mindset. So we could think about food and schools as part of how we ensure children's right to nutrition and make it part of a safety net the way that it was more seen in the past. So in terms of fostering and sustaining solidarities, the theme of this conference, what I want to say is that relying on these special categories of citizens as targets of compassion is not going to deliver sustainable change for hungry families. And the only way that we can really help children is by supporting their connections with their families and their communities, not trying to address them outside of that. And Jacinda Ardern's commitment at the UN to make New Zealand the best place in the world to be a child means making it the best place in the world for people who are caring for children. So the people looking after children have to be valued and resourced sufficiently and we need to shift away from deserving and undeserving distinctions and think about food insecurity in terms of rights. Thank you. Kia ora, e whakamihi ki a koutou katoa. My name is Bridget Masters Awatere. I know Ottilie has done an introduction at the beginning of this symposium, but I just also wanted to acknowledge people of the land, wherever you are watching this from, and acknowledge our hosts who are hosting the International Conference of Community Psychology. Um, so from me here at the University of Waikato and my people of this land in New Zealand, greetings to you wherever you are. So today's, well my presentation today is about highlighting some of the aspects of our research or the research that I've been involved in as a community psychologist. So I am the convener of the Community Psychology Programme here at Waikato. And I just want to talk about one of the projects that I have been co-leading, uh, and in particular uh, in this project, the highlighting of food insecurity and its impacts on families, and our role as community psychologists in advocating and lobbying for change. So this project that I have been involved in essentially came about in terms of recognising that hospitalisations occur um, unnecessarily, so repeat admissions to hospital for children under five, so paediatrics admissions, were preventable if a broader approach to wellbeing and health for the children was taken into consideration. So this project is called Hasi Hauora Tamariki, and it's looking at the well-being of children through the effectiveness of a tool that has been developed um, to ensure that adequate support systems and access to services and entitlements are engaged or kicked into gear, I guess, from the hospital perspective. What we also bring to this project and this um, tool is a whānau order approach which means not just the child admitted to the hospital, but recognising that that child is just one um, sort of symptom in terms of the wider family. So if a child has presented with um, lung infections multiple times, asthma, bronchiectasis, then there's likely going to be similar issues for the siblings in the home. So taking a broader approach in terms of the well-being of the family is one of the key issues of this approach that we were testing. Um, so I just wanted to provide an example here of uh, one of the questions within the tool. It's not too complex. The tool itself is just a series of questions. <coughs> and here we've got an example of one question. Um, the tool could take anywhere between 45 minutes or 20 minutes to an hour 45 depending on the needs of the family that we were um, interviewing. One of the questions here on this example is just around, do you have uh, a general practitioner service that your family is registered with? So the assumption is when by the time they get to hospital that they've already been to see a doctor, but if a family hasn't been um, registered with a GP, 
been clearly they weren't been able to access that primary care that would have could have prevented the hospital admission if they had timely access to let's say asthma preventers, uh, inhalers, etc., or appropriate medications. So this uh, project involved research assistants who asked the questions, but not only did that, but followed up and ensured that they were registered with GPs if they family identified that they weren't currently registered with a GP. So this project involved um, recruiting over, or almost a thousand families, um, 500 of whom received the usual care, which was assumed to be a high quality of care, and then 500 of whom, whom received uh, the hearty tool, which involved that series of questions. Um, from those um, two pools of uh, participants, we um, selected those who had, um, who were identified in terms of having high needs, i.e. who were low income, low socioeconomic status, poor access to resources. So the New Zealand deprivation, high on the New Zealand deprivation and the NZI deep scales. So we did uh, interviews with approximately um, 25 families, so some who were qualitative, uh, some who were in the Hamilton region, and I've got the map there in the bottom corner, and some who were in the wider outer Hamilton or Waikato region, but still within the hospital um, catchment area, which is quite a big area. So it's really to see the needs or the responses of those families who were recruited through the study. So what, one of our intentions with the interviews was to make sure they were conversational, so they didn't seem like customer satisfaction surveys. So what did you like, what didn't you like? But though there was a component of that, our emphasis was on the, in the qualitative interviews, we had a team of community psychology researchers was about understanding their experience. And in the context of them being low income, um, having low socioeconomic status and resources, we really wanted to get um, into a conversational space where it didn't feel like we were targeting them. But what we wanted to show was that we were interested in their, really interested in the experience and how we might help them moving forward um, for other families in similar situations. One of the main findings that came through in our interviews as well as our survey in terms of like the more consumer satisfaction, was food. Food being an, a really important factor for parents and caregivers who were in the hospital alongside their child. So this study involved children who were admitted to hospital um, who were zero to five years old, so anywhere from you know, newborns to preschool or just about to start school here in New Zealand that's five years old. And what I wanted to highlight here was that we had, um, what I'm putting up here is some examples from families who talked about their experiences. We've given all of the um, participants pseudonyms to maintain their confidentiality and their privacy around um, their personal lives and their experiences. Um, but you know, we've drawn on their quotes, so it's their words and what their experience. So we've got Lyle here who has four children who range from 10 years old to seven months. And when she was uh, supporting a child in hospital, she was supporting her seven month old uh, who was admitted to hospital because uh, he was having breathing difficulties or breathing issues. Um, and obviously as a seven month old, he was not on things like roasts. He was on pureed food and so Essentially what Niall was saying is that all she had to eat was whatever her seven-month-old didn't eat, um, which was pureed food because she had no access to food while she was in hospital giving support and care to her child. Then we've got Astra. So Astra was um, mother of a child who was six weeks old when they were admitted to hospital in the early hours of the morning because they had um, stopped breathing, or the six month old had stopped breathing. She was a bit panicked and took them to the hospital, rightly, um, and got admitted to the hospital. Um, 
and through a process of the ad admissions, she was not, there was a box not checked against her name that said, you know, she should be having food or meals while she's in there with her child who was only six weeks old. Um, so Astra was able to access toast in the morning um, because the nurse support her son, um, not because she was you know, given proper meals. So she had to rely on family members to come in and visit and bring her food when she could because she didn't want to leave her young child, young baby, by itself. Um, we've got here Jodie who has three children, six, four and one. She was also living with her uh, unwell father in his rental property in Hamilton. They had moved from the outer regions of the Waikato catchment area into the Hamilton city area to be close to the hospital because they had been um, in and out of the hospital so many times with their young child and their health issues. Um, Jody broke down in tears when we gave her a voucher which was part of our process for every family we interviewed. We gave every family a $100 food voucher that they could then you know, go and purchase food to the value of $100 from their nearest supermarket. And when we did that to Jodie she broke down in tears because she had just been um, in a state of stress because she wasn't sure that she was going to be able to feed her, her children or what they were going to eat, as soon as she you know, used all her money while in hospital looking after the sick child who was admitted. We have Claire, um, she's in her early 20s, she has two children, aged three years and 18 months. She was studying at a polytechnic, trying to um, upskill herself and get a better paying job. She was living with her father in a low diesel suburb in Hamilton, so um, not a family of high means. Her 18 month old was born six weeks premature and so she had been also in and out of hospital. Um, and in the year that we interviewed her, she had been in and out of hospital four times receiving this similar type of care for her 18 month old child. Um, one of the uh, points that Claire raised was that she couldn't go home, it was too far in terms of her income and her means and leaving her child. She wasn't getting any meals at the hospital so what she did after a bit of anxiety she was, was walk to the nearest um, dairy or superette to buy a pie and a coke which you know there was a special that you could get that for two dollars a pie and a coke and so that's what she's um, survived off while she was caring for her child in the hospital. So one of the key findings, or some of the key findings that we just want to connect or bring to the fore here in terms of our research was while the study was focused on ensuring that there was final care in terms of when the child was admitted to hospital, there wasn't a broader context of how the hospital was causing this additional stress and strain on families who already had low incomes. So mums who were in hospital looking after their young child were relying on their partner, most often the fathers um, of the children, to do the home care of the children at home, go to work and bring food for the mum who was in hospital. So the additional stress um, and resource that demanded of families was really taxing on them. One of the questions that came up when we were um, lobbying to hospital staff is, well, why don't they just ask for help? Why don't they just ask for food? Um, and yes, sometimes mums did do that and were turned down because you know, the right box wasn't ticked or they had, you know. Um, the flip side of that, nurses did try, but it was very ad hoc. There wasn't really a systemic approach to providing support. So, you know, in the context of being a young, so most of these mums were young, and I mean young in terms of 40 and under, with an under five year old. Indigenous mum, you've got a double count against you in terms of, we've got this system here in New Zealand that if you 
are flagged as being potentially a un, un well or un, a mum who is unable to take care of her children, the state will intervene and take the child or your children from you. So there is a real palpable fear amongst these mums that they could lose their children, their families, if they rock the boat in terms of saying they're unhappy with service. Um, or to say that they need anything. So it took a lot of trust in the mums to allow our research assistants to get that information out from them about what they need, what they wanted, and also their fears. Part of the challenges that we faced from the hospital staff was that um, comments about the kitchen being at capacity, there was no ability to make more food for mums or there's no money, it costs too much, the hospital is already in debt. Um, when we did the costings, it was um, I can't remember the exact figure, but it was ridiculously cheap. It was cheaper than outsourcing a catering service from outside to bring in the food, which was one of the options we also looked into. Um, but it, it, at the basis of it is basic human care. And if you have a child in the hospital who cannot, um, who does not eat solid food or is needing that social, cultural care support from their parent or caregiver while they're in the hospital, you know, parents aren't there having a holiday. So they also need to be fed. So part of our push was about making sure that the policies in place acknowledge basic human decency in terms of caring for parents and caregivers while they were in the hospital trying to um, support and care for their child. Just wanted to highlight the policy here in terms of this policy that we um, found the gaps in that the hospital was using had just been repeatedly rolled over since the 80s. It was developed in the 80s. Someone had done a bit of a literature research and found that, you know, or picked up the value position that mothers who continued to breastfeed after 12 months chose to do that. Really, the infant should be able to eat solid food. So if a mother is in hospital with their child over 12 months, they don't need to be fed. Um, and that policy, continually being rolled over, has just you know, fed into that kind of entrenched system of mums choose to feed their children. We don't need, the hospital doesn't need to feed them um, once the child is over 12 months. But some of those examples we showed here today were children who were six weeks, six months, and still the mothers weren't getting fed. So there's clearly a, um, a gap in the policy or the implementation of the policy. Um, there are exceptions to the policy in terms of if the mother has diabetes or a health condition and needs to receive medical, uh, regular meals, etc., while in hospital with their child. Um, but the policy, obviously, as I said, has its flaws. Just highlighting now in terms of moving towards wrap up some of our, uh, the impact of our work. There are now serials, so we've been advocating in terms of these gaps. There's now serials provided on the ward for parents, so parents can, you know, have cereals throughout the day. There's bread there as well for toast, uh, but we've also engaged a voluntary support group called Good Bitches Baking, and they provide ba good baked goods uh, weekly that are collected and served by the hospital volunteers. And we still continue to lobby for policy change, and we continue to meet with various directors within the hospital space. So just uh, wrapping up and connecting to the community psychology theme and conference, wanted to highlight how, you know, in this context, one-size policies that have just repeatedly been rolled over don't take into context our current situation in terms of income and sense of well-being and can perpetuate health inequities when they are considered from the position of those who have power, privilege, and resources, and they're not mindful of those who do not have such things. 
some of the conversations we engaged in with staff seem to suggest that policies could never be changed, but that, we know that's not the case. Policies can be changed and policies should be changed to adapt and adjust for the context that they're being implemented. Um, yeah, we wanted to highlight that you know, access to healthy sports and foods is not just about making better choices. But sometimes, you know, the situations that families are in, I mean, they are restricted and severely impacted in terms of their income outside of the hospital, not just during the hospital admission, but once they go home, as we talked about earlier with the family who were struggling to um, buy food for the week because of all the money that had been invested in feeding the mum while she was in hospital supporting her young child. Um, so I just wanted to wrap up by saying, you know, this is this particular presentation and all of our presentations have been about highlighting our observations in terms of the context of food insecurity, but recognising the wider impacts in terms of moving away from victim blaming or individual behaviour change that needs to occur, but looking at the wider system and the impacts of policy and how policy changes can contribute to human flourishing. So, um, on that point, he mihi nui kia koutou katoa, just to say thank you, and um, hopefully next time we'll get to see you in person. Kia ora. <laughs>